forget all you know about podcasts. We welcome you to an experience uniquely different. Please join us for our coverage of all entertainment on the fringe of society. The candles are lit. The lights are down low. It is now time for our host. As he steps up to the pulpit, the sacrifice has been prepared for the midnight black. Ghastly Halloween greetings, groovy ghoulies, and welcome to a special Halloween edition of the Midnight Black Mass. (laughs) We've got uh, a very special segment we've dug out of the archives tonight for you. As our feature presentation, uh, we'll have stuntman extraordinaire and actually part-time actor who was one of the few men to don the outfit of he- of Hellraiser's Pinhead in the Clive Barker classic horror series, a gentleman named Kevin Helms who appeared as Pinhead in Hellraiser 3. Uh, we had a great interview with him in 2012. Uh, it has not made an appearance since its original airing live on the Georgia Wrestling History Radio Network back then. And so now we're happy to bring that to you here and to archive it as well as part of the Potty Humor Network network exclusively for Halloween. And here, of course, is my co-host, the Southeastern Strangler tonight for the Halloween edition, Mr. Andrew Alexander. (laughs) Of course, there's always the mouse of hell. How's it going, man? (laughs) As always. It's going good, man. I know you're excited. Uh your your favorite holiday here, and if the, if the fans enjoy this episode, man, you they just can't wait until they hear the next holiday episode of the Not Black Mass Thanksgiving Spectacular coming in a month. We're oh wow! Turkey. <laughs> We're gonna talk tar- turkey and stuffing and all all the good shit. Cranberry sauce and more. <laughs> oh yeah! Outstanding. Well, uh, in addition to that. I actually had the opportunity of visiting Orlando, Florida, a beautiful time of year to visit sunny Orlando as it's bitter cold in the mornings already here and then sometimes in the evenings uh, in the fall. Our fall it seems to be very short in the southeast, and it goes to winter pretty quickly. Uh, but I crossed that South Georgia line on down into Florida for my wife's and I's fifth wedding anniversary. Uh, we actually went to Universal Studios on our honeymoon, and so we recreated that trip for the five-year anniversary because I'm smooth like that. And uh, we fucking did the Universal Halloween Horror Nights, which uh, we're both big horror fans, uh, and it was just like a dream come true. This year was even better than the first time we did it. Um, just so many cool things. Of course, this is Universal Studios, folks, so this is not some run-of-the-mill rinky-dink haunted house. Um, you know, this is an extra ticket. It's a fairly pricey ticket, but we actually, a uh, wise move, inside tip from the Rev. If you're down in Orlando and you're checking out the Halloween Horror Nights, or even if you're in the Hollywood version of it over in Los Angeles, um, if you get in the park before they close at 5 p.m. during the day, you will get put in a special queuing area. So what I actually got to do was they kind of locked us in Springfield while they were getting ready for Halloween Horror Nights. And I just sat there and drank Duff beer, and me and my wife chatted with some of the locals, uh, not the locals necessarily, but, you know, the, the people who were there in the park, uh, you know, also getting ready and just got excited about everything. And so they release you a little bit early if you do that. And we actually got first pass on everything, walked on to Walking Dead, escaped from Terminus immediately with no wait. Um, that was fucking great haunted house uh, makeup and effects by Walking Dead Television's own Greg Nicotero. So it was high grade zombies, just like they cra- crawled right off the television show, uh, coming out at you. And a lot of shout outs to the the season with Terminus, uh, where the colony of cannibals attacked Rick and company, and they had to fight them, including the sweet. Um, I don't know if, if you are up to date on the Walking Dead or that show you watch at all, but uh, the the scene where they slit the throats in the bathtub it was recreated in the haunted house and that was pretty excellent yeah that was a badass scene i haven't uh i'm up to date to walking dead up till this season and it looks like i'm just going to wait and binge watch it uh at the end 
but the, the big thing of this season has already been spoiled. And, you know, I, I, I'm not one of those people that expect to, to get away with not watching a show to the end until the, sh- the season's actually over. So, uh, can't be, can't be too mad about that. Plus I, I wouldn't doubt if there's not some chicanery going on there, but we won't spoil it here. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, this year I'm going to wait and watch it, just binge watch it once the season's over. But that that scene you're talking about, uh, that was that was pretty gruesome, badass stuff. Uh, yeah, it sounds awesome, man. That's uh, pretty kick ass getting getting the jump lines and hang out. I know, I'm sure you were just eating that shit up. Oh, I was. Yeah, like we we were just fucking just laughing it up. It was just amazing, you know, the zombies jumping out and we jump, we kind of sell it, but. We were pretty much just screaming about how badass it was and high fiving and shit. <laughs> and like, uh, so then, then we went from there to the American Werewolf in London haunted house. Um, one of the coolest fucking things I've probably ever seen. And um, that says a lot. I mean, the and the Freddy versus Jason was even cooler. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But um, I don't know if you've seen that movie. Are you familiar with the film I'm talking about? Uh, I'm familiar with it, but I actually have not seen it. Wow, being such a connoisseur of, of 80s classics, I'm kind of surprised by that. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's one of those. Uh, there, there's a there's a little list of movies that I definitely should have seen and I haven't, and it's, it's on there. But yeah, I've, I've actually never seen it start to finish. Well, I highly recommend it, first of all. Um, it's definitely one of those you-must-have-seen-it horror movies, so definitely check that out. And I mean, it's like a quintessential 80s movie anyways. It's got, it's got a great soundtrack. It's got a, you know, two, it's really fucked up, though. It's not like, like, like it, it's the classic tale of the wolf man with, like, a whole new spin. Like, they really sell the build of, like, you know, him getting bit and what's happening to him and shit. And then he goes on his fucking rampage and shit. But, um, like, the whole the haunted house took you straight through the movie. And the, the Rick Baker special effects, I don't know if they just recreated them or if they actually got, like, some of the original props, but it looked exactly like the werewolf from the fucking movie and that thing was gnarly man that thing was horrifying you know and um it was so lifelike and realistic and huge you know like i said this is a, a million dollar a billion dollar effects company behind these haunted houses so you know if you're a horror fan it's just something you have to do uh because you're never gonna see like this shit up close and personal like that anywhere but in a movie you know and it, it's just amazing so, and, and, like, even American Werewolf of London, we got in, like, 20 minutes, like, still a short wait. And the lines have finally piled up. But they do a really good job of getting people through there pretty quickly. Uh, you know, I think the longest line we saw maybe was 90 minutes somewhere. And then, uh, you know, most on average is about an hour per haunted house. That's why we waited to get into to Freddy versus Jason. And it was well worth the wait. Um, so, part of the haunted house, they take you through Elm Street. And you have the creepy little girls with their eye sockets carved out, jumping rope. And one of them got me, dude. <laughs> one of them got me good. Uh, okay. Like, they were just jumping rope and fucking staring at us. And so I started singing a song. One, two, three, it's coming for you. Uh, three, four, shut the door. Hey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And, and so you know I'm, I'm having a good laugh with my wife and we're walking past them and you know I, I'm keeping eye contact with them the whole time because they look fucking awesome for one and two like you know I don't want to fucking try to jump out at me while I ain't looking and so the second I turn my head that second would fucking snap right up in my face <laughs> like ah <laughs> <laughs> and you know, if you remember the ones from the specific Freddy vs. Jason movie were really fucking creepy, uh, with with the eyes carved out. Like that was one thing about that movie that really stuck out as a, a great horror effect. Um th- that was great. And then you know, like you go into the fucking to Nancy's house with the stairs and like it's like Freddy's here is painted on the fucking wall and uh like all this super cool shit. It's really, really fucking awesome. Um, like, uh, it like starts paying homage to the different nightmare movies. Like, you get uh, your favorite scene of all time. Uh, Welcome to Primetime Bitch is right there, where <laughs> Freddy's a TV putting a head through it, and then the scene uh, from Dream Warriors, like where he turns into the fucking worm and eats the guy. You know, like that's all in there, and fucking, uh, they really the did a great penis, job. The big penis shaped worm. <laughs> yes, yes, that that's the one. <laughs> And then that, they take you. That through. sounds freaking badass. 
Yeah, they're playing, of course, like the sound effects and shit are like all over. So there's like sound bites from the movies and fucking like the music playing the whole time. And then you go through Camp Crystal Lake and you go through a fucking like uh, bunk of the, you know, the the camp counselors and like all the kids are fucking dead on the beds. <laughs> like, and, and, you know, it just like takes you through the fucking tour. It takes you in like what's supposed to be an underwater scene where you can look up and see like a fucking canoe like floating above you and like seaweed and shit hanging down and uh like you look over and like little Jason like comes out at you and shit, you know, like <laughs> uh this like they did such a great job of that, of course, and then after you go through all the individual stuff, you get them fighting. And like at the end, uh there's got this one scene of like animatronics fighting where fucking Jason takes his sword and or his machete rather and, and stabs Freddy and they like splash you with water and it's like dark where you are you know but their shit's lit up so you can't see that it's the you know they're making like blood so that's fucking awesome yeah. uh it was, it was a great little effect and then at the very end like they're fighting one more time and Jason goes to hack at Freddy's head and then you think you're out of the haunted house and right as you're about to step out of the fucking door Jason fucking jumps out with Freddy's head in his hand <laughs> And chases you out of the house. Yeah, that sounds that sounds freaking cool, man. Uh, and and not only do you get better quality because, like you said, it's you know the fucking real deal. But you know, you go to that type of stuff when people may like that atmosphere, but I definitely do not. When you go to that stuff and it's fucking freezing because it's October and it's cold as shit, but you're down in Florida and I'm sure the weather was absolutely perfect to be walking around in this shit. So. Yeah, that oh, sounds, I got that a tan, awesome. dude. For the first time in my life, I think I got a tan. I didn't even burn. It was like perfect weather. <laughs> oh yeah. wow! Yeah, that's <laughs> that, that's pretty that, legendary. That's a, sign of, that's a sign of horror if there ever was one. <laughs> yeah, for real. So, uh, so, so that we we did that, and then we did one more haunted house. Um, it was the uh, Alice in Wonderland, like uh, Psycho Asylum or some shit like that. Uh, I can't remember the exact name. I know that's not right. But uh, it was a 3D, like, Alice in Wonderland turned into a horror movie. And it was so fucking cool. It was like a big acid trip. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, they had, like, really fucked up looking, like, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And uh, the Queen of Heart, like, cuts Alice's head off at the end of it. And fucking, uh, you go through this, like, crazy tunnel that's, like, spinning. But, like, it's also got, like, 3D shit on the wall, like, jumping out at you. So that was really fucking a mind fuck. So that was really awesome. Uh, another thing they do is the scare zones, where which are just like um, out in the park. In most places, they just have people out there dressed up like fucking chasing people and shit. Like just jumping out, you know, it's madness. Like, and that's, it's so much fun. It's like the whole thing's an immersive Halloween environment. They have different little areas set up. Like one of them was the Shady Brook Asylum, uh, and it was, like, supposed to be, like, a Halloween fall festival, but these inmates had broken out of a fucking asylum, and so they'd, like, killed all the people in the fall festival. There was this guy, like, bobbing for apples that was just, like, deader than fuck, you know, and the, the inmate was just, like, dunking his head underwater and, like, holding a show. Uh, and, you know, they had, like, chainsaws and shit, and they were chasing people around. So that was pretty cool. But And they had various different ones of those. They had, like, outside of the Alice one, they had a bunch of, like, fucked up Disney characters, like, Belle and the Beast, like, Belle had, like, a safari hat on and a fucking gun, and she was, like, all mangled and clawed up from the Beast. <laughs> and, so this doesn't uh, sound like, this doesn't sound like they intended this for, like, families. Like, this sounds like some no, it's stuff, it up. Man, for children. Yeah, yeah, 13 and up is the minimum recommendation. Like, it's definitely adult-themed. Awesome. Well, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fucking jealous now because I was standing here thumb in my ass while you were having the time of your life. So did you it oh, sounds, yeah. did you uh did you get an application while you were there? It sounds like this would be a perfect thing for you to slap on some face paint and run around <laughs> scaring people. I fucking should have. Like I <laughs> I would probably like if I could just go live down there and make a modest living working in an amusement park, I I would probably do that in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> well hell you probably could. Yeah, I know I have the talent. It's just do I want to fucking do that? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, like the only other thing I'll mention is like uh, one of the scare zones was a classic monster scare zone. So it had like a bunch of the classic Universal monsters like Frank uh, Frankenstein, uh, Dracula, Wolfman, 
Invisible Man, uh, Norman Bates, uh, like the zombies from the Night of the Living Dead. They were all painted black and white. So that was so fucking cool, like in and of itself. Like, you know, they were all like this retro costume look. Like they just walked out of a black and white movie. Yeah, yeah. Like their skin was gray, you know. Like that sounds awesome, man. I I I wish I could have could have seen something like that. Maybe maybe next year I have to make a plan to go check that out. Yeah, I would definitely recommend it. Like the other, then it had uh, like some more modern characters like Jason, Freddy, Chucky, uh, Linda Blair's character Reagan from The Exorcist. Uh, like you know some some more modern characters and shit. So I got a bunch of pictures. We'll we'll post them on the. Potty Humor Facebook, definitely want to check it out. So, I heard uh, you had a, uh, you, you've discovered one of my recommendations and you liked it. I did. Uh, in, Monday night, I decided to watch the first episode of iZombie on Netflix. And Wednesday night, <laughs> I finished season one of iZombie. So, basically, pretty much in two settings. I knocked out that whole first season, and I'm almost caught up to season two, episode four. Uh, probably after we record this, I'll probably get back to it. But yeah, man, that show is that show's pretty damn good. Uh, good shit all around. Uh, some good characters. The the chick, you know, the main chick. She's she's super cute and de- definitely grown on me. And uh, she she played and uh, she was on Once Upon a Time. She played Tinkerbell for. Uh, a little little stretch of time, uh, but it's totally cool, man. When she eats the brains and like she acts, you know, like the person who whose brain she ate for a little while till it's out of her system. So she's got a different feel, different character every episode, and solving crimes and lots of mystery solving and all that shit. I mean, it's just it's all around good show, man. Yeah, some of her dis- different personalities are pretty fucking hilarious too. Like they really do a good job with that. Oh yeah, I mean I've seen her. She, you know, she was kind of a, a, a airhead teenage girl cheerleader type, and uh, she was like this grumpy old man dude. She was bitching about everything and had like a she was kind of racist. And you know, a partner on the 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 cop on the show, the this young black dude, but she was just saying these little racist things because she was you know a, an old sixty seventy year old man, and that's what they are. So. Yeah, there's been some good shit, and there's, you know, the, there's some love stories and some, uh, you know, of course, the type of problems you would think you would have if you were a zombie about keeping the secrets from people and stuff. It's it's a very interesting spin on the, the zombie thing, which is kind of always, for the most part, kind of always told in the same type of story, but it's definitely done differently. And, uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. I mean, I've knocked out... By the time it'll be three days, and I'll probably finish like sixteen episodes, seventeen episodes. I think there are, and I just I just went through it quick, man. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely well, recommend it you. to anybody listening. To just, I mean, at least give it a try. Yeah, I'm glad you took my recommendation there. Um, I, I felt it was down your alley when I saw it. You know, it's got all those elements, uh, but it, it definitely is one of the highlights of my week. It's right up there with Flash. Uh, you know, it, it, I love that block of the two. I always watch them together. Yeah, I may have to start doing that. I, I try to watch Flash and Arrow together. I mean, I know they're on separate nights, but I try to watch those together. And maybe, maybe I'll include this one, but uh, it kind of varies week to week. But the uh, CW man, I, I like their, I like their shit. They put together some good shows, man. Yeah, hopefully that Friday the Thirteenth show will come to fruition, and that would be. Another great addition. Yeah, I'll have to watch that one for sure. At least give it a try. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, let's uh, we'll just touch real quickly on the wrestle news right now, since there's very, very little wrestle news. Alberto Del Rio allegedly re-signing with the WWE. What are your thoughts on that? No, allegedly, hell, he showed up at the pay per view and beat John Cena. Oh, well, shit, see, that's how behind the times I am. Right now, if it ain't called Halloween Havoc, then I ain't going to watch. So, I mean, I, <laughs> oh, know, man, I, I was actually on vacation, I, but I'll probably check it. <laughs> I got text messages. Hey, you going to watch this pay-per-view? And I was like, oh, I forgot there's a pay-per-view. I just I just hit up the red box, so maybe I'll watch it later. So I watched it late that night, but uh, he was the big surprise 
uh, mystery partner for Cena. It was interesting because Zeb Coulter, uh, um, Dutch Mantel, made his return. And, you know, he was always the uh, the big pro-American guy, but he's with Del Rio now, and they're, they formed, I, I think they're calling it Mex America or some, some shit like that. But either way, you know, he, he's returned. It's kind of a, a little bit of a shock. I mean, I do I don't rule anybody out ever, no matter what they do or what they leave for, because it's the wrestling business and uh, everyone comes back. But, you know, he had the issue where he slapped the guy in the mouth, and from what I heard, rightfully so, and uh, went away a little bit, and he's come back. And the rumor is he's got, you know, a lighter schedule. I'm sure he's getting paid well and comes in, takes the belt off Cena, uh, the U.S. title off Cena first night. And I think this is kind of a... I mean, it's hard to be in that position, and it definitely helps that he's Hispanic and they really need, or at least they feel they need, and I, I mean, I agree with them that they they need that Hispanic character to replace like a Rey Mysterio, somebody to really draw uh, the, those crowds in, especially when they do tours in heavily populated Hispanic uh, markets. But, uh, you know, this guy showed that, you know, sometimes you just got to leave. Sometimes you got to Stand up for yourself. You got to tell them to shove it. Go away, and maybe come back and get. You know, who knows how like this guy's schedule is? Who knows what perks or what kind of money he's getting coming back? And just you know, kind of leapfrogging everybody on the card for for the spot. Uh, you know, the Fed better be careful because people might smarten up to that. And even though they are the only place to go to make make that real money, to make that big money. Um, this is just kind of setting an example to maybe you can go out there to the independents and keep making a name for yourself and let them know that you're, you can be a value to their company. Like, you know, apparently he did. So I think that's a, uh, that's pretty big news, but big news for us personally was coming off last week's NXT tapings. Our, uh, our buddy who we've hopped up a lot on the podcast, Dash Wilder becoming one half of the NXT tag team champions out of nowhere. Yeah, that's pretty huge. Um, I, I was pretty blown away to hear that and very happy for him, of course. And on the same night, um, two other guys that we worked a lot with, Corey Hollis and John Schuyler, showed up on NXT. Don't know what the the whole scoop was with that or, you know, if that was just to come in and put somebody over spot or if that was a, like we're looking at your spot. But they certainly turned a lot of heads and uh, just showing more people that, there's a lot of talent here south of the Mason-Dixon line that often gets overlooked because the Northeastern circuit is a little bit more popular with the Internet community. And now uh, finally some of that light getting to, to be shed on the great talent down here. And they've been busting their ass for a long time, so it's rightfully so, and hopefully that continues, and that's a trend that we see more of. Yeah, and I actually think uh, those two worked, uh, Dash and Dawson, um, later on in the tapings after they won the tag title. So I guess their first match is tag champions. I believe were against Hollis and Skyler. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty much, I doubt that there's ever a case where it's just like, okay, here's two guys. Let's have them put these guys over They, I mean, they're definitely looking for, for talent and, uh, in, they keep a close eye on anybody they bring in. And I'm, uh, I'm under the impression that that wasn't a last minute thing that, you know, I mentioned on, uh, last episode that some empire talent would maybe going to Orlando and, uh, I was clearly right as Corey Hollis shows up on their TV taping. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully something big comes from that. And I don't, I don't know Skyler uh, as well, but I know he has worked a lot in this area. I haven't, I don't know him near as well as uh, a lot of people do, but I've heard a lot of good things. And um, I think he's pretty close with, uh, with Dash Wilder. So hopefully, hopefully something will happen to those guys, man. I'm all for I'm all for anybody anybody we've stumbled across uh, getting a getting a job and it makes our area look good and especially Corey Hollis I mean I think it'd be a big a big step for Empire specifically because it's you know here's an Empire guy that's been competing there pretty regularly this year uh, you know on top of his Ring of Honor dates and stuff like that but uh, every little bit helps so hopefully those guys get some good reviews coming off that. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very happy to hear, and uh, that uh, just goes to show that got to keep an eye on the, the Phoenix City Invitational show. That got to keep an eye on the South. There's a lot going on down here. A lot of great talent. Uh, a lot more that you probably haven't heard of that you probably will. So uh, keep looking. And congrats to Corey Hollis and John Schuyler, as well as Dash Wilder and Scott Dawson, the NXT 
Tag Team Champion. So, uh, going to do a little, little teaser of playing favorites here in a minute. Uh, we're going to talk about like their top three favorite horror movie villains here in the spirit of Halloween before we get to our featured interview. But before we do that, just wanted to know if you had a favorite childhood Halloween memory or not necessarily a favorite, but one that stuck out uh, that you wanted to share that might be entertaining. Uh, I had one that it sticks out just because, and I, a lot of times when I went trick or treating as a kid, uh, past a certain age, and I don't even mean like a teenager, like pretty young, I just didn't dress up anymore. Uh, I, 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 I kind of felt, and I guess I've always been like this, where if you can't do it big, don't do it at all. So I never was into these little rinky dink costumes that especially that we had growing up. Uh, so I didn't dress up a lot. I would, you know, chaperone my si- little sister basically and get me some candy. But uh, I remember being really young and maybe my first or second Halloween that I can remember for like the first two or three, I was the, uh, I went as the ultimate warrior uh, with the face paint and stuff like that. And I remember I went to a house and there was this kid like right beside me who was also the ultimate warrior. It was like, okay, that's a coincidence. And his his mom and dad were with him. And my, you know, my dad was like in the car. I should say my sister's father, my stepdad at the time. He was in the car, like on the side, you know, on the street. But like he could see me and stuff. So knock on the door. And this house just happens to be friends of these people that's with the other ultimate warrior. So he's like, oh, come on in, come on in. So we go in, and he closes the door, and I'm standing there, and I'm like, trick or treat, and, I, and he's just talking, oh, yeah, blah, 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 oh, the kids look great, blah, 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 blah. Well, he thought that I was with this dude, and that we were just a pair of Ultimate Warriors, and that I was with his family. So I'm in his house for, like, several minutes. Finally, like, they smarten up, and they're like, hey, he's not with us. So he gives me a candy, and I leave, and my stepdad's like, what the hell happened? I was about to come in there. <laughs> like, I mean, I had to be in there for five to ten minutes just standing there like, give me some candy. I'm trying to get out of here. But he thought I was with them. So I was like mini abducted for uh, a, a handful of minutes there. And I just remember that. I must have been, you know, I might have been six or seven years old, but that just rem- that just seems pretty funny to me that that happened. Yeah, that's pretty fucking hilarious. <laughs> you ended up at a family Halloween gathering without <laughs> intending to. Like, hey, I'm just trying to get my fucking candy and leave, pal. <laughs> Another kid. I, I mean, don't give a fuck good. about your kids. Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't even a good Ultimate Warrior. I think outside of face paint, he didn't have like shit. You know, he didn't have no wig or nothing. But oh well. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I have several, like, uh, it's something I've always got and done, but I think what I'll share this year is, um, you, <laughs> did you ever come across the house with the free candy sign, not the free candy sign, but, the like, the big bucket of candy that would just have the take one sign? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you were the lucky first motherfucker to come across that, that's the only way you're getting candy on one of those. Uh, but um, <laughs> I remember the days of youth-born mischief, um, you know, when you're like a preteen, 9 or 10, 11, 12 years old, uh, when you're just, you know, running, ripping in the neighborhoods and shit and uh, just being an, an all-about hellion. And uh, we used to go roll these kids' yards that we didn't like and fucking, <laughs> um, you know, like all, like the, the, trick, uh, the trick part of Halloween, the prank part. You know, that's really a, a lost art, and rightfully so, because people always take it too fucking far, uh, you know, and actually, like, damage people's property and shit, and that's not cool, but, um, yeah, we definitely fucking uh, would, like, fuck up the, my buddy's neighborhood that I stayed at, at his house, and, and we would go through and just, you know, like, roll yards of toilet paper, and, uh, you know, throw some eggs and shit, and fucking, uh, but... <laughs> Of course, you know, you come to the house with the rich people that live there and they would leave the bucket of candy that said take one. And like now as an adult, like with a moral code, I would only take one. But, you know, (laughs) as a mischievous preteen, that wasn't fucking happening, you know. (laughs) The bowl got emptied into the bag, so we ended up with pillowcases full of candy that night. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's that's awesome. And man, when I would see those, like I would actually, I would actually only take one. Uh, maybe I just was under the impression that that's one of those situations where people are probably watching. But uh, you know, maybe maybe I would maybe I would just put the hand in, maybe take two or so. But I never em- just emptied it out. Uh, and, and, and I just I just can't remember exactly, but I'm sure they didn't put the the highest quality candy in the uh, the take one bowl on the porch unattended. So, uh, and I remember I remember it always be funny how I would just take advantage of my my little sister when we would get back. You know, you do the the, the uh, candy trading, which I'm sure you did too, having a younger sister. And uh, like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll give you this. I'll give you all of these candy corns for one bag of Skittles. Oh, that's a great deal. <laughs> I'll give you these strangely wrapped chunks of peanut butter candy and black and orange paper <laughs> for your Hershey bar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because who eats, man? <laughs> As an adult now, I would like to go trick or treating, and when someone hands you some of that orange and black candy or candy corn, just be like, "Hey, what the fuck is wrong with you? Buy some real fucking candy." <laughs> I'm all right with candy corn, but the the black no, and orange candy. Man, that shit is garbage. And looks like the people that hand out the box of raisins. What the fuck? Box of raisins? Get a fucking clue. They're nature's candy. <laughs> Dog nature's candy, my ass. <laughs> uh, so, great Halloween memories here on the Midnight Black Mass. And uh, speaking of great Halloween memories, of course, the season would not be complete without horror films, which, again, our feature segment is going to focus on. But I uh, wanted to talk just a little taste of our regular show, Playing Favorites. We're going to do a real quick, less than 10-minute uh, rundown of our top three horror villains of all time. So who do you have for number three, Andrew? So this is a tough list. Is it top three favorites or top three greatest? No, it's top three favorites. Greatest is so debatable in that category. It's just favorites. Okay, and I mean, and and mine would be a little interchangeable. I don't study the genre as well as you have over the years, and I don't – I don't I don't love every single villain that's ever come, you know, I definitely find some are just kind of eye rolling worthy. But uh I'm not gonna try to reinvent the wheel. I'm probably not going with anything shocking. My number one is obvious, we've talked about it before and it there's no debate in my mind. But number two and three are a little bit of a toss up. I'll go with number three, I'll go with Michael Myers. Uh I I would put him number two as far as greatest because I think he is a uh, actually scary of uh, He's become iconic. I mean, Halloween movies. Um, as far as series, a lot of movies that add series, I think they're pretty good. They they hold up, you know, most of them. Most of them are pretty good. Um, the first remake was, I thought, really badass. The second one was eh to me, but uh, I, I would have to go Michael Myers. Mike actually ranks in number one for me. Um, he's, uh, you know, to me, like everything about Halloween is embodied in those movies, especially the early ones. Um, they're not all great, but the character is just, there's something mysterious about him that's intriguing. Uh, he's sympathetic to a degree as, you know, as sympathetic as a child murderer can be, <laughs> but, um, he's like, you know, it, it plays on the whole mental health thing. And, uh, like of course in the original movies he's just the shape you know he's he's this nameless faceless creature uh he's just the boogeyman and you know he kind of embodies that and uh, i think those movies like one and two are two of the greatest horror masterpieces ever um one is you know far outweighs all of them in my opinion but two is still pretty good uh, three season of the witch. I actually liked, even though it didn't have anything to do with Michael Myers. It kind of gets unfairly shit on. It's a really weird movie, but I dig it. Uh, and uh, Halloween four is pretty great. Halloween five kind of sucks. Halloween six is fucking terrible. H two O was good. <laughs> Resurrection sucked a dick. Halloween from Rob Zombie one was really good. I thought, and then Halloween two was off the rails, kind of crazy. But um, but still, like to me, the character of Michael Myers endures. There's something about him. Uh, I I'll, always will be my favorite. It's probably nostalgia, a lot of it, but definitely ranks number one for me. So, uh, and, I, and I get I get confused on some just some of those because I haven't watched them uh, all in a long time. I've never seen part three. I know that it has nothing to do with him, and it's this own different thing. 
Uh, I would like to watch it. I guess I need to do that at some point, but I've never, I've never actually seen part three. So would you, so do you rank Halloween, the original as the greatest horror movie of all time? Is that your top pick for that? Unofficially, like without putting any thought into it. Yeah. But like, I could probably maybe change that if I really, really thought about it. There's a lot of things I love as much as that, but I don't know if there's anything I love more. It's almost a little unfair because, correct me if I'm wrong, part two is like a direct tie-in. Like, you almost need to watch them together. Like, Yeah, I mean, in the sense that, like, at the end of part one, like, Dr. Loomis fucking shoots his ass and he falls out the window and they think he's dead. And then they go and look and he's gone and the music starts playing again and we're out. Spoiler alert! Yeah, for a movie that happened in 1978. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere, somewhere, there's one guy listening, going, "Those motherfuckers!" Spoiler <laughs> alert! Damn it! <laughs> the movie's only 50 fucking years old. 40. Uh, okay, that's a, okay. So you're number one. I, I mean, I, I would, I would. He's definitely high up. I mean. He's out there. He's iconic for sure. Uh, the mask, or the old Williams Chatner mask. Uh, the music, you know, is part of the big things that make an iconic uh, horror character. And there's some great horror characters that are that are really good and have a big cult following, but they don't cross into that iconic status like a Michael Myers or a Leatherface. But uh, yeah, I definitely I would put him up there. I think he's probably one of the scarier ones. He's probably scarier than my number one pick. But that's my number one's not based on being scary or anything. But uh, I guess I'll go with my number two. My number two is uh, again iconic. The music, the tempo. Some of the movies are pretty good. Uh, some of them are really rough. <laughs> Looking them at them at a series. Uh, I don't, I don't understand anyone who could justify this series going up against my number one pick series, like as being better. Like it's one of those things that there's no debate. Like I don't get the debate. Like when you say Friday the Thirteenth is the greatest, I'm like, no, you're fucking crazy. But I do put Jason Voorhees number two on my list. Uh, I mean, the fucking hockey mask. I mean, that's that's a symbol anybody knows. Yeah, uh, Jason, like, <clears throat> he was actually, he, he was going to be on my list if you didn't pick him, but I had a backup because there, I have so many that I could put in this three hard, but, you know, just for the sake of talking about different people. Without a doubt, oh, Jason fu- is I, one of my all-time favorites. I, I fucked up. You didn't, yeah, you went, you jumped to your number one. What was your number three? I'm sorry. Let's forget I just said that. What was your number three? Oh, you're fine. Uh, number three, actually, I wanted to go with a classic, um, The Wolfman, uh, Universal, the Lon Chaney. I just love that movie. I love uh, the story of the curse and uh, the gypsy lady reading his palm, you know, your left hand shows your past, your right hand shows your future. <laughs> Again, then he sees the, the pentagram and shit and just um, like, I don't know, there's something about that movie that really terrified me as a kid. And, uh, like, you know, even though now you go back and watch it, it still holds up. Like, not a lot of those old movies from that time period, especially because acting was just so different. You know, it's very overdramatic and, uh, like, kind of overplayed. It's still kind of in the Greek theater type because, uh, you know, as movies had really just come from theater basically at that point. So everything was still, like, kind of very overstated. But, um, my God, I love that fucking movie. Like, the original, I think it's 1942. Wolfman with Lon Chaney Jr. is one of the greatest pieces of film you will ever see. Yeah, and I think I think um, even people that can appreciate the older stuff like that and older movies, which you know you and I can, I, I think that we do get spoiled in a lot of ways to where going back to some of these movies where if they're not dude, so great and they don't have that awesome story to where they stand up, it's just it's difficult to watch because we're used to so much shit and you know the fucking planet attention span is a million times shorter than it was you know 20 years ago and we're we're not immune to that uh we may be we may fight the disease off a little more than others but we're definitely not immune so sometimes with those you know especially like you're saying going back to the 40s and 50s you know a lot of those movies that back then were mind-blowing and people probably just lost their shit over you know, it's very hard to to 
you know, cross over to today. But that's a movie that I know I've seen, uh, you know, especially younger and stuff. But I just I can't remember details about it. Uh, obviously, any of those characters from that classic monster movie phase are are good picks for this topic because I mean they're 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 iconic and definitely stand the test of time. I was uh I was speaking to someone the other day and I was like, What's your son gonna be for Halloween? And she's like, Wolfman and I was like, Oh well that's that's cool. You know, a uh, um you know, eight, nine year old boy is going as the Wolfman to to trick or treat, you know, so it still it still holds up. Yeah, absolutely. And then what you're saying about Jason for number two, you know, real quick, just, um, yeah, absolutely. Like a, a favorite pick of mine, I would have made my number two, but um, just for argument's sake to talk about something different that we are kind of running out of time, um, I'll just say that, uh, yeah, I, I got my picture taken with him at the haunted house, you know, like fucking definitely huge fan of Jason. I have t-shirts, um, you know, uh, like I love the character probably more than a lot of the movies, though some of them are great, some of them are eh. Like you said, as a whole franchise, there's definitely some hits and misses, but uh, just a, a great character, and that's just really stood the test of time. But uh, my number two would be the Tall Man from Phantasm. Um, I fucking oh, love well, those that, movies. That's a good pick, man. I haven't seen I've seen quite a few of those movies back in the day, but I haven't seen them in years. I would love to watch them again. That's a scary motherfucker. Yeah. You're coming with me, boy. (laughs) Yeah, man. Do you own those movies? I don't, though. um, They're around. I think Phantasm 2, at least, is on Netflix. Yeah, I need to. Yeah, I need to watch those again, man. Because I remember I seen they they had you know back in the day when they actually showed good old movies on TV and shit. You know, it shows how old we are. But I remember I remember one day I watched probably three or four of those in a row on TV. And, you know, there might've been some stuff taken out, but I just remembered like this guy's awesome, you know? So yeah, that's a great pick. And we've discussed your number one, Michael Myers, definitely a good pick. And everyone knows my number one, we've talked about it before, but Freddy Krueger is there. There's no, there's no even close second to me. Uh, And I think the, uh, the series of movies, you know, there are some that are dud worthy, but the Nightmare on Elm Street series, I think is the greatest, horror movie series of all time. Uh, most of them are pretty damn good. And, you know, he's like, he's like a, he's like the fawns of horror, you know, he's this, uh, he's dark and he's, he's scary at times, but he's got the one liners and he, he's definitely cracked some good jokes and had some fucking epic kills in the series. So, I mean, that that's, that's definitely my number one hands down. Hard to argue. Probably the most merchandised horror character of all time would be Freddy. Um, so, oh, definitely. Yeah, d- definitely an iconic pick. And also one of my favorites. So we're out of time here for this part of the show, but we'll be back right after this break with Kevin Helms from Hellraiser 3. Don't go anywhere. The film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths. In particular, Sally Hardesty and her invalid brother, Franklin. It is all the more tragic in that they were young. But had they lived very, very long lives, they could not have expected, nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see that day. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon drive became a nightmare. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Thank <laughs> you. 
life. Nah. This is the Reverend bringing you the hottest show on the coast for all things on the bridge. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome our special guest at this time, Mr. Kevin Helms. Are you on the line, sir? I am, sir. What's going on, Dan? Hey, it's going very well, and we are very privileged to have you here on the show. Thank you for joining us, sir. Oh, I'm flattered to be here. It's good to talk to you. Excellent. And, well, I understand you got a big date coming up. A couple of dates, March 23rd through the 25th, Charlotte, North Carolina, the Mad Monster Party. This is your first ever convention appearance, am I right? It is. It is my first. This is my first to do um, anything associated with uh, Pinhead, so it's, it's good to get this going. That's outstanding, and from what Robert Everett, who uh, was kind enough a great associate of the show to hook you up with us here, uh, indicates this is also one of your first radio interviews ever? Um, actually, it is, yeah. So you're, you're um, getting my cherry cracked on a couple of levels. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, there you have it, folks. History being made on the Midnight Black Mass. Uh, well, Kevin, uh, I don't know how much time you have, but I'm going to ask a few questions, and we can just move right through it at your pace. But uh, first thing I'd like to ask is, how did this, this whole thing come about? As, as we've uh, spoken to our fans that you did play Pinhead in a portion mm-hmm. of Hellraiser 3, uh, where did this all come from? Um, well, I had worked in the, in the background in the commercials and stuff for probably about a year or two. Um, I did my first PA gig in 89. Um, I got out of school in 91. Um, and uh, at the time, I was dating somebody, and she lived up near Winston-Salem. Uh, and she was modeling. Uh, she was with an agency in Greensboro. Um, and I have an art degree. and I had a background in photography and such, so I started working at the agency. I was doing photography work, darkroom work, and also kind of trying to get into the talent side of the agency. And uh, the movie came to town, and uh, they came to our agency looking for people to come uh, do, you know, extra work, what have you. She ended up going, um, she was a model at the agency. She ended up going and getting the stand-in gig. She was Terry Farrell's stand-in, and then they said, you know, you know, Kevin, you should go there and try to get the stand-in, the male stand-in, uh, which has been, you know, being Doug Bradley's stand-in. So I went, uh, I met the AD and the director and stuff, and um it worked out, so I ended up getting a stand-in gig. So I was kind of there. Um, and after several weeks on the set, I don't know. They should have known this beforehand. I thought it was funny, but they realized it was like, okay, there's a scene where Doug, you know, Doug Bradley, needed to be in this, you know, Pinhead needed to be in the same scene with Elliot Spencer. And they realized, you know, he couldn't be two places at once. So uh, they came to me and looked at me and thought, you know, this guy can do it. And um, I ended up, uh, ended up being able to do it. That's outstanding. Now, were you a, a fan of the horror genre prior to that? So, did that add to the experience? If so, no. It was it was a great it was a great thing. I do I do love horror movies. I mean, I, I was a big fan of the more not so much uh, Hellraiser. I mean, Hellraiser was good. I loved Hellraiser two. One and two are both good. Two. I saw an unrated version of two, and it blew my mind. It was just it was fantastic. I, mean, I always you know like The Shining things like that. But um, I knew about Hellraiser. Um, and just being on the set, it was just a, it was a cool set. Uh, we shot mainly in High Point, uh, a little sound stage there. We shot a good bit in Greensboro. and actually shot one day in Charlotte, um, which is where I live now. But um, it was just a phenomenal. It was my first time being on a like a full movie set. Um, I'd done like like I said, smaller stuff, PA stuff, commercials and and whatnot. But uh, it was my first uh, movie gig and. Looking back on it, I mean, it was it was a really it was a it was a great time. That that sounds outstanding. Like it, it absolutely was a, a dream come true for a, a horror fan. Uh, even though, as you said, you tend to lean towards more psychological based horror uh, than the in your face stuff like like the Hellraiser. But that that's still outstanding. Um, now I, I'm told that you have a very interesting recounting of what it was like to become this powerful and dark character in Pinhead, and that there was actually a, a possession of sorts. Am I right? What, um, well, what it was, what, what I do remember, when I, when I think back on it, there are a few things I do remember. I remember my, my first meeting, um, actually, first time I ever seeing Doug on the set. Um, if anybody's ever been on the set, they'll know that it's for 
stand-ins and some actors and, and extras and stuff, it's hurry up and wait. So you spend a lot of time at the craft service table, you know, eating and all. So there was one day um, I'd you know, been drinking tea and stuff all day, so I ended up, you know, you know, of course, going to the bathroom. I'm standing there doing my business, and I hit the door swing open. And as uh, yeah, I'm standing there, I just kind of, the corner of my eye, I kind of look, you know, to see what's going on. And standing there next to me is, is Doug, and uh, he's got on these old gray sweatpants, a purple sweatshirt with the sleeves cut out, and he's got the pin, the pin head, the head appliance on, nails the whole bit. And he's got these, like, these clear, like, flock of seagull, like, uh, prescription sunglasses, I mean, glasses. And he has a cigarette in an extension, like the like the ladies, like, in the 30s, like Greta Garbo would smoke out of, you know, because he didn't want to get the, he didn't want to get, you know, the cigarette, because they do your mouth and everything, um, and he's just standing there, and I realize, okay, I'm, I'm staring at this guy, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, he just kind of looks at me, and he notices me, and he reaches up, and he pulls a cigarette out of his mouth. And I apologize for my bad English accent, but he goes, hello. <laughs> I just realized I'm just standing there. You know, I hear I'm in the bathroom with Pinhead. And I just thought, it's just, it's just a funny initial, um, you know, you know be, being able to, you know, to be initiated to this guy like this. Um, but he... Uh, when they decided for me to do this, um, I, I came in, uh, the first one had to be at like 6 in the morning. Um, I got in the chair, the makeup chair, probably 7 o'clock. Um, I was in the chair from 7. They worked with me constantly from 7 until, uh, I think it was about almost almost 2 o'clock, between one thirty and 2 o'clock. So it was about 7 hours. And it's a full, it's a full deal. You start with like a bodysuit, and the, the costume itself is... It's amazing, I and mean, it's leather and wool. It's like the tightest, nicest motorcycle jacket you've ever had on. It's like it's on you backwards, like a, almost like a, a corset or a straight jacket. I mean, it's just it's intense. And but when you're done with it, the only the only part of yourself that's not been augmented in some way is the white of your eyes and inside of your mouth. And it's strange when you've got it on, you really you you. You, you cease to exist, really. You become. It's a stra- it's a strange thing. It is a, it is a total one hundred percent. It's a it is a costume. We've all gone to Halloween. We've all you know put on the hobo costume or whatever. Putting on the pinhead costume, if you want to call it that, it's a complete psychological. It's a transformation. It really is. You kind of stop being yourself, and you you look in the mirror and you go, oh shit, that's me. And it's it's a, it's a <laughs> It's a strange, it's a strange thing. It really wasn't. I always, remember, I'm talking about it now. I'm getting goosebumps, but it was a. You, you look in the mirror, you just go, wow, and you get it. You know, you might, it, you really do. You get, you understand, and it's like you kind of feel like that. You want to say the things he does. It's like a. It really was that. That was the most special part about it. I think was just feeling it. Um, I, I can sympathize with that, and, and actually, you know, if you go back to some things, people like Jack Nicholson have said it's actually a, an old wives' tale in Hollywood that Nicholson warned Heath Ledger about picking up the role of the Joker, because once you became such an intense and heinous character, and you had to put all of yourself into making that believable, that you kind of carry a piece of that with you, and, and it's a little bit dark for some folks to be able to take. I, I can't imagine. I mean, I, I can't imagine um, doing it for an extended period of time, but it really was. And I just want to say something about um, Doug. He was always very cool with me, and honestly, he, and honestly, he, he didn't he didn't have to be nice to me, but he was very smart guy. You could tell he just he had that theater voice. Um, just carried a great presence about him. Um, I, I do remember this funny. The first time that I ever got into the uh, to the makeup the the trailer was right beside the sound stage so they you know they did me up and like I said, the only part of your body that is not changed in some way is, is you know, it's your eyes and your mouth. So you're sort of it's almost claustrophobic really. I mean it's such a an intensive change. But I, I walked in and as I'm walking in, the craft service table's right there, I'm walking in, people are hanging out and um I can remember people going, Oh hey Doug, how you doing? Hey Doug and they didn't even get it. So I walked in and I the yeah the script supervisor, she walked by. She goes, hey, Doug. Hey, and she just kind of, it's like somebody had shot her. She goes, oh, shit, that's not Doug. Kevin? <laughs> and I was like, hey, how you doing, you, Hillary? Yeah, you think you maybe could have fooled someone into just going in and, and doing the take. It, <laughs> you didn't well, pull it, a good rib yeah, on an well, executive I mean, there. Everybody, I mean, everybody else knew at some point, yeah, that wouldn't have gone through. But, 
Um, no, I just remember Hillary. She's like, Kevin? I was like, hey, how you doing? You know, and uh, people are standing there talking to me and, you know, like going, wow, you know, it looks good and everything. And then as they're talking to me, I can see they're, you know, they're kind of gay. He's looking behind me, and I heard one person go, here he comes. And, of course, it was, it was Doug. He was coming on the set. So I turn around, and there's Doug standing there. You know, he's got like an eyes odd and some jeans. And, you know, he's ubiquitous. He always had tea in his hand because, I mean, a lot of the crew was English, so he had his tea. And, and he, was, he was just standing there looking at me, and he kind of – he was probably about, probably about 20 feet away, and he walked up. He got about – five feet away and he just stopped and he leaned in and he got a little bit closer and once again I'll apologize for my English accent but he goes my god you're me and it, and it just really I mean he was just he was just looking at me just like yeah I guess it was for him it had to have been weird because um, you know Pinhead was his baby he had been given to him by Clive they were friends in, in England you know to my understanding and um, but it was just uh, uh, he really was just just kind of giving me that look, you know, kind of like I would imagine like uh, somebody's been living in the woods for years. The first time I saw an airplane or something, you know, he was just looking at me like, holy shit, because I was the first person. I don't know if anybody else has ever done it, but at that point, I was the first person had, that had ever been in that except him. Uh, so, but, and, but from then on, it was always, he was always, you know, when we when we were shooting, he was very helpful. He'd be like, okay, in this scene, this is what Pinhead would do. You know, and we'd, you know, you need, you know, he would, you know, give me cues on like intensity and do you know, pin up and do this and that and he would talk about, you know, pin like it was a real person and it was um very helpful. Like I said, very intense guy, very smart guy. Um and uh I really I just I would have loved to have I, I would love to have done it more. Yeah, I, I kinda knew at the time I'm like, I'm not gonna do this again. Because you could just tell because if that was I don't know that he was very happy. Um about me doing this, and I don't bl- I don't blame him a bit, and uh, so I just I was just flattered to do it, and uh, I ended up being in the full makeup um, two days, and then there was a third day they did some special effects stuff, and I basically did like you know shoulders up, but yeah, but for two days I got to walk around, and it's um, and that co- that costume is intense, it's really I mean it's it's laced onto your back, I mean it's it's just it's just it's a beautiful thing. And for anybody that wonders the um, the pins, there's actually I guess it's sort of a like a trivia question. There's 142 nails, and I remember at the time they had 144 and they had two extra. But there's 142 in the head. And, and, and I, if I can ask, how did they apply the nails? Because that's all. I mean, I, I'm guessing it's just some sort of adhesive material, but it, there's no, it's, it's well, very convincing. Well, to what what they told me, and um, Bob King was the head makeup guy, and uh, Paul was the one who did my makeup mostly. Um, the the original pinhead, the appliance was five pieces, and it was a it was a pain in the in the ass to put together. And by the time they got into three, it was basically two pieces. It was the face was one piece, and then the rest of the head was a second. And of course, spirit gum and all. But they're like um, back in the day, we used to call them sex nuts. You would you push up it's two pieces. The nails get pushed up from the inside. They put the you know the appliance on, and then they cap them. They're handmade brass. So basically, they shove and you know, they push the one piece up to the inside, put the piece on you, and then cap with the nail all the way around. I guess it's okay to say that. I mean, I don't think it's a big secret, but um, yeah. But there's a there was 142 uh, nails, and uh, they had two extra, so they made a gross at 144 and 142. So we're like, Kevin, don't lose one. <laughs> you know, we've only got two. So. That that's outstanding. A lot of horror fans I know are are curious about things like that, and that's the audience that we cater to here. So uh, again, we greatly appreciate you taking the time, Kevin, to give us these stories and anecdotes of uh, such an amazing experience. Now, uh, when when it was all over, when it was all said and done. Uh, you moved on, and, and did you do anything else in film, or did you, did you go up into other avenues? Um, did, kind of where did your career take you after Hellraiser? Um, after Hellraiser, it's funny. I really didn't, didn't do any more acting. I worked for years. Um, you know, like I said, once again, I live in Charlotte. I worked. Uh, we have an um, an IOTC local here that does, uh, you know, film work, uh, theater work, and I worked with them for years. Uh, that's actually where I met Robbie. Um, um, I'm actually I have a degree as an art uh, as a painter. I'm a painter, um, and actually this weekend in Charlotte I have a uh, a show tomorrow night. If anybody's in Charlotte or around, um, there's a uh, a Noda section 
of Charlotte is a, a new brewery that just came up called Birdsong, and I'm having a, a show with some of my paintings tomorrow night uh, from 7 to 10. Um, and also I have a, uh, a Facebook page of my art. It's not a very clever name. It's just Kevin Helms, artist. Um, I do I paint. Um, I do um, I teach. I'm a, a college professor. Uh, I teach part-time at a couple different schools, uh, digital media, uh, things like that, Final Cut Pro, editing, things like that. So kind of pieced together, cobbled together um, in existence. <laughs> so that, that's fascinating, though, because you, <laughs> you always wonder, you know, I, and certainly being in the entertainment field myself, I know how it goes. Uh, you're always looking for that next gig, and you're, you're always trying to figure out, you know, what you're going to do uh, to move forward. And, and a lot of folks go into the, the more behind-the-scenes area of things and, and make out a perfectly good living. And um, it, there's, you know, there's a lot of creative people there, and, and probably more so than than should be because of the way the economy and jobs are. But uh, still, uh, that, that's absolutely fascinating. And and there you, you have it, fans. Uh, we do have a lot of fans in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Um, we've had several folks from your neck of the woods on. Gideon Smith, Robert himself, uh, had our own instant on. Uh, so we, we've got a lot of fan base there. Uh, you'll need to go out and check out Kevin's art show uh, and his Facebook page, as you said, at Kevin Hilms Art. Uh, now, I know you talked about doing art and being a college professor. Um, we like to get in the heads of our guests a little bit here on the show. And uh, since this show is about media and, and sharing good things, valuable entertainment, uh, we'd like to ask what our guests are into. Uh, musically, what what type of things are you listening to musically? Uh, you got any great TV shows or movies that you've seen that you'd just like to talk about? Um, musically, I listen to pretty much everything. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a rap person at all. Um, back in the day, oh, God, yeah, I don't, I don't get it. Um, but, but, I mean, I listen to it's, – it's changed a lot over the years. I remember back in the day I used to love um, – I listened to Skinny Puppy a good bit. Um, and that you know that type, and I know that uh, at the Mad Monster Party, I know Nivik, the uh, Skinny Puppies, Skinny Puppies former lead singer, is going to be there. I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to get a chance to meet him. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts. There's a podcast of England called Radio 360, um, and some other stuff like that. I just listen to a bunch of different stuff. There's nothing I really stick to. Um, I do love old sci-fi. I love Blade Runner, beautiful movie. Uh, chance to get me Rucker Hauer who's also going to be a Mad Monster. That's going to be a, a thrill. Um, of course, I love all the old Star Wars. I'm an old guy. So I, you know, I was there. I went the second week that movie came out. But um, I just I love uh, – oh, I was going to say what I saw the other day. I, um, well, I was going to say I forgot. Um, no, but mu- music is just across the board. Just don't play rap. And new country wears me out. I love old country. Um, yeah, I do too. I, that, that we've actually had Hank Three on the show and had a, a very extensive discussion about that. That new country music is terrible, but that that old stuff was really fantastic. And there's guys like him out there still trying to to beat that style into people's heads that this you know doesn't get a lot of play. Uh, but but I'd agree. And, you know, going back to Skinny Puppy and, and some of those goth bands, I'd actually been. Uh, asked by, by Robert to, uh, to to bring this up just as a topic of conversation. Uh, I, and I, I agree. I talk about Skinny Puppy, bands like Kraftwerk, Gary Newman, Switchblade Symphony. Um, Gary, Newman, uh, that was, that was the, Gary Newman was the first album that I ever bought about Gary Newman Telecon when I was in junior high school. So that's um, all my, it's funny, all my friends had older brothers that listened to like old rock like Nazareth and all that stuff and I, I didn't get it and then the first time I heard Gary Newman I'm like oh my god that's it so I went I used to have a storage show I call a record bar and I went and I bought um, I bought Gary Newman Telecon so that's that's kind of where my head started yeah it, it was and it's funny that you mentioned those bands because you you can take that style that uh sleek synthesizer icy cool sound and you can take uh, the the fashion and the wardrobe there, and you have to look at maybe what an undeniable influence that Pinhead was on the gothic S and M subculture. Uh, you know, a, a wardrobe trend setting he had, obviously, but uh, he derived pleasure through pain as a true and classic masochist figure, and uh, he sort of developed a brand new kind of horror that was sleek, leather, and sexy. A true innovation for our ever changing times. It really was, and in that in Hellraiser two, it's hard to find now. But Hellraiser two, there used to be an uncut version. Um, it's when uh, Doctor Schnarr brings the uh, patient into the room, and he uh, 
he's imagining that he has, I think he's imagining that he has like maggots, it's like maggots crawling him, and he hands him a straight razor because he wants him to cut himself and bleed. And he actually, in the uncut version, is, he actually it shows this guy slicing himself up. And it's one of the most intense things that I've ever seen. And I've actually tried to find this version of it. And it's really hard to find. So if anybody can find that uncut, it's, I mean, it's one of those, you kind of, you cover one eye and look at the other one, it's like, oh, my God, and just the sound effects and everything. It's, it's yeah, it's very intense. That That's incredible. Well, as we're wrapping up here, this has just been a, a fantastic look into your life, Kevin, and, and you always, we love to bring interesting people to the show, to our masses here in the congregation of the Midnight Black Mass itself, and you've definitely filled that role, and we greatly appreciate it. As I've mentioned, folks, Mad Monster Party coming up March 23rd to 25th. You can go to themadmonsterparty.com to order tickets. Uh, you were mentioning some of the guests earlier, but we're talking about uh, Bill Mosley is going to be there, legendary horror actor. Um, Absolutely. Uh, David Prowse. I've met freely. David Prowse once before. No, yeah, I'll go ahead dude, with the David Prowse story. I was just, just popping like a no, fanboy no, no. over Ace Freely being there. But, yeah. Ace Freely, sure. Uh, PJ, um, PJ from Rock and Roll High School, she's going to be there. But I you know David Prowse will be there. I met him years ago. I worked briefly for a Comic-Con in San Diego, and um, I got a chance to meet him. Um, it's been a long time, but it's for me. It's just just to be back and see all these people. I'm, I think I'm a I'm a probably going to walk in and my jaw is going to be needing to be picked up off the floor. I believe I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be for me. It it will be a special time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm actually going to do everything I can to make it out there that weekend. Um, Rev's got a lot of things going on with my various wrestling commitments and what have you. But it's funny that you mentioned you met David Prowse at Comic-Con because I actually met him at Dragon Con where I do the, the wrestling events annually down there. So uh, that that's a pretty weird symmetry. But uh, in any event, now with this being your first convention appearance that we've mentioned, um, I just got to ask, what brings you to the public eye after so long? Kind of what are you expecting beyond having your jaw hit the floor? Um, I mean, I'm really not sure. A lot of this is um, totally due to um, Robbie. I mean, I've been friends with Robbie for a long time, and uh, he always, you know, when I told him that I'd done this, he had a, an interest in it. Most people don't care, which I think what I, which I, I was talking to Robbie and I, I thought it was funny. A few people, when I'd tell them, you know, I never made a big deal out of it, but I would tell people, and they kind of, most people would be like, oh, that's great. Uh, anyway, but, you know, you, every once in a while you would tell someone, they go, God, you know, and Robbie was one of those, and he dug it, and he actually contacted me about this, and he said, you know, is this something you would think about doing? And um, and it hit me. I was like, wow, this is this this could be a lot of fun. And I've really, I mean, we've been kind of working on this a little bit for a couple months now, and I'm I'm really enjoying it. And I, you know, I'm re- I'm looking forward to. It. I don't know what to expect, um, but I'm I'm definitely looking forward. I'm, I mean, I will be there as you know. I'll have a table, I'm there, but I'll also be there as a fan. So I'm going to kind of get, I'm going to be able to get a little bit of both. Yeah, and that's always the great part about those things, you know. Uh, and if it's anything like any of the other cons I've been to, it's just going to be a, a big fucking party after it's all said and done. So, there you uh, go. Everybody is going to be having a good time down at the Mad Monster Party this side. Well, if you, make, yeah, if you make it, you got to come by and say, hey. I absolutely will, man. We'll have a beer or whatever you're into. <laughs> got it. <laughs> oh. Well, Kevin, uh, it again has been an absolute honor and a privilege to have you on the show. Uh, we would love to have you back in the future to talk about how the Mad Monster Party went and maybe any future cons that might come of that. You got it, man. I've had, I've really, I've enjoyed it, and I thank you very much for having me on. Hey, thank you very much, Kevin. Have a good one. Rock it out. You too. Thank you. All right, see ya. This has been a production of the Potty Humor Network. Find us online at youtube.com slash potty humor or subscribe to us weekly and never miss an episode by searching Potty Humor on iTunes or Stitcher. Thank you for listening and good night.